Today is 3, 21 to 31, and I'm reading from the message. But in our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets witnessed all those years ago has happened. The God setting things right that we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. For there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we've been compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both us and them, and prove that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us, God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing within himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where we always want us, he always wanted us to be. And he did it by the means of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear that world of sin. Having faith in him sets us in the clear. God decided on this course of action in full view of the public to set the world in clear with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus, finally taking care of the sins he had so patiently endured. This is, this is not the only clear, but it's now. It is current history. God sets things right. He also makes it possible for us to live in his rightness. So where does that leave our proud Jewish insiders' claims and outer claims? Cancelled? Yes, cancelled. What we've learnt is this. God does not respond to what we do. We respond to what God does. We finally figured it out. Our lives get in step with God and all others by letting him set the pace, not by proudly or anxiously trying to run the parade. So where does that leave our proud Jewish claim of having a corner on God? Also cancelled? God is the God of the outsider non-Jews as well as the, as the insider Jews. How could it be otherwise since there is only one God? God sets right all who welcome his action and enter into it. Both, both those who follow our religious systems and those who have never heard of our religion. But by shifting our focus from what we do to what God does, don't we cancel out all our careful keeping of the rules and ways God commanded? No, not at all. What happens, in fact, is that by putting that entire way of life in its proper place, we confirm it. This is the word of God. A pretty short message title today, Good God. <laughs> um, and of course, that's the, the centre of the gospel is really about who God is and that he's a good God. It's not centred about our goodness, or the lack of it, it's centred around who God is and what his nature is like. And that's what this passage is actually all about. And what Paul is trying to do here, and he's one of the first people ever to put this into writing, and it's a difficult concept that he's trying to put forward here, um, he wants to talk about the righteousness of God. And we, we really need to understand that passage or understand that, that word righteousness and as it relates to God because that's what this whole passage is about and if we don't get that, we won't get the, the meaning of the passage. So he starts off in this passage we're looking at today saying, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So... Um, he starts off by talking about a righteousness that is of God. Um, now, what is the righteousness of God? That's, that's the big question. What, is it to, what do we mean when we say the righteousness of God? Well, let me, let me illustrate it with a passage out of Athanasius' great um, book called the, On the Incarnation. One of the earliest books written 
And uh, so it's over 1,500 years ago this was written by Athanasius. And he was only around about 20 years old when he wrote this too, by the way, which is amazing. One of the greatest theologians ever. And he was a fourth century theologian. And in the second chapter of the book, which is called The Divine Dilemma, he talks about the righteousness of God in that. And he says, and I'll quote, it was unworthy of the goodness of God that creatures made by him should be brought to nothing, sort of brought to nothing, through the deceit wrought upon man by the devil. And it was supremely unfitting that the work of God in mankind should disappear. As then, the creatures whom he has created reasonable, like the word, were in fact perishing, and such noble works were on the road to ruin, what then was God being good to do? Okay, you see, that's a really important question. What's God going to do? If God is good, and he is, and if God being good, what's he going to do with us, human beings, and with the creation, which has got itself in a big mess? Uh, I'm, I'm sure anyone who's a parent has had to ask that question at some, po at some point. What am I, as a mother or father, being good to do with my child? Um, and Jesus said, you know, even though you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give anything to you who ask? So let's you know, take it up a bit and saying, what is God being good? What's he going to do with a broken creation? And then he goes on and says, was he to let corruption and death have their way with them? In that case, uh, what was the use of having made them in the beginning? Surely it would have been far better to never have created them at all than to have neglected them and let them perish. And besides that, such indifference to the ruin of his own work before his very eyes would argue not goodness in God but limitation in that, in that far more than he had, than that he'd never created men at all. It was impossible, therefore, that God should have man to be carried off by corruption because it would be unfitting and unworthy of himself. Right, can, you, can, you see what, can you see what Athanasius is saying there? He said, this is God. This is who he is. He's a good God. He has made us, but we have been carried off by corruption. So what's God going to do? If God is really good, he's going to go after us and he's going to save us. He, otherwise, there's, there's two dilemmas here. One, he could just say, well, I'm going to be completely just and I'm going to let them just perish because that's what they deserve. But then that would show God to be limited, to be weak. But then if God just says, oh, well, I'll just, you know, overlook what they've done, then he would show himself to be unjust. So there's the dilemma there. And... That is the dilemma which Paul is dealing with here. He's talking about, well, how does God show himself to be the true God? And, and what's the way in which he has done it and revealed himself to be the righteous God? So, um, and, and, he, and what he does is he, then he goes back and says, well, in the law, and by law we don't mean a list of ethics to keep, but rather the first five books of the Bible, he's saying in the law of God, and his dealings with, the, with uh, Israel, and then also spoken about in the prophets, we have seen that God has been good to Israel, even though Israel has not been good to God. And, and God showed himself to be a good God in some form by the way that he kept his promises to Israel all, over all the years. But now that goodness has been revealed even more powerfully and even more potently in the person of Jesus Christ and the ministry of Christ. Can you see that? So what he's saying is God was good then, but he's even better now. He hasn't become better, but rather we have a better revelation of God in Jesus than we had through the law. Because under the law and under the covenant that the people of God had with, with God, they were unfaithful to him. But God was faithful to them in spite of their unfaithfulness. But, 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 but God was looking forward to the day when he would do something about that and bring repair to them in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, you and I, 
after the fact of the resurrection, can look back and say, ah, that's what God has been doing all along. That was the plan of God all along. And so we see the righteousness of God in even more clarity. And that's the point that Paul is trying to make here. Now, having said all that, um, this passage, in, particularly in, in Romans 3, verse 21, and I'll read it again, for now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. That has been one of the most misunderstood passages in the whole New Testament. In fact, in the whole Bible. It's been, you know, even today, right now, in theological circles, this is being hotly debated. And uh, people's reputations are being put on the line. And, uh, you know, there's there's, there's, um, backwards and forwards still happening even now. You'd think after 2,000 years we would have worked this out, but no. Uh, it's been a, an argument that's been going for 2,000 years. It's still being hotly debated now. And one of the reasons for this is really comes down to what's, this, what's Paul really saying here? Is he saying that this is the righteousness of God or is he talking about a righteousness from God? And um, in fact, you know, this is, I've got the latest version of the NIV here. This, is, this was produced in 2010. And ever since then, the new version of the NIV is different than the old version. In the old version of the NIV, which came before 2010, of course, it actually says something completely different. What it says is that there is a righteousness that is being revealed from God. In fact, I've got, I've got the, old, the old NIV study Bible and the comment that's offered in the, on this passage in that um, argues that this passage is contrasting, and I quote, between the righteousness gained by observing the law, which is impossible, and the righteousness that is given and provided by God. That, that sounds right, doesn't it? But it's not. And that's why the, the old NIV is no longer translated that way, because that's not what it's saying. And uh, you might say, well, that's a bit arrogant of you to say that, David. I'm just quoting the best scholars, all right? I'm just, I'm just this guy, all right? I'm nobody special when it comes to that. But there are some people who are special. <laughs> and the very best of the, of the Greek scholars say, no, we've, we got that wrong. We translated it that way because we wanted it to say that, but that's not what it's actually saying, and it's not the point that Paul is making. The point that Paul is making is that under the, through the law and the prophets, we have a testimony about the goodness of God, that God is good to his people, no matter how bad they might be, he continues to persevere with them and to restore them. And if you look at Israel's history, it's a history that shows the goodness of God, not the goodness of the Jewish people. Um, there was one uh, rabbi who was on radio one time talking about the Jews, and he said, you've got to understand the Jews, the Jews are just like everyone else, only more so. <laughs> And so, and so the Jewish story is a story which is for the whole world. And, and what the Jews learned was that we cannot save ourselves. We need someone to intervene on our behalf. And the intervention was God provided them, um, you know, oblations and so on, and a way of, of paying the interest on the bill, so to speak, but not paying off the principal. And then Jesus comes and he pays the principal, does the whole thing. But the old covenant kept them in touch with the grace of God and then the grace of God was enacted in Jesus and then something completely changed. And that's what Paul... Paul isn't contrasting trying to be... be, you yourself be righteous under the law and then, then you receive a gift of righteousness. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is God was righteous under law and now we see the fullness of that of God's righteousness, <laughs> which is the goodness of God, the mercy of God and the justice of God is displayed in Jesus. And that's what makes the whole, the whole difference. And so that one little word, of, changes the meaning of everything here. Uh, because it's not saying a righteousness from, it's saying a righteousness of. And so the, the, um, the, right, the righteousness that is... Um, of God 
is not just a righteousness from God, but rather it's God himself who saves us. Now, of course, this all begs the question, then what is, what is the righteousness of God? Now, the word righteousness, inter interestingly, here, I know this sounds, we've got to get through this, all right? I've got to, I've, we're not going to get the rest of Romans if we don't get this, so we, we have to do a bit of hard work here. But the word that's translated as righteousness can also be translated as justice. So, um, so whenever it talks about all the cognates of the word righteousness, which includes justice and judgment and, and um, righteousness, then they all come from the same root word. And so it's, a, it's kind of a big concept that we have to get our head around. Um, so getting your head around the word righteousness or the word just, we have to understand the original meaning in the Greek and all of its cognates. Now, one of the ways that this word is used in the Bible is to denote something or someone who is equitable and fair and right. So when we talk about the righteousness of God, we're talking about the nature of God. We're saying God is righteous in the same way that Athanasius is saying God is righteous. God, being good, doesn't just let his creation go to corruption. He saves it. That's the kind of God he is. He's not weak, nor is he unloving, but he does something about it. And so that's the righteousness of God. Or we can speak of something being put right or literally straightened or justified. So the word ju justified. So, um, so righteousness is either talking about the nature of God or it can be uh, the action of justification, doing something which is good and right and fair. So justification can be something like to be declared in the right or to be made right and to judge fairly and to judge justly. That's all the ways that this word is used. Now, justice, as we understand it, I don't think we fully understand what justice is, but biblical justice is not the way we understand justice. Um, I, you know, I once heard of a particular court case in the United States where it was around the trial of a man who had murdered a young woman. And the man was convicted ultimately and sentenced to be executed by the state. And then after the trial, the young, the young woman's family were gathered outside the courthouse and they were surrounded by a press of... Uh, TV and radio journalists, and one of the journalists asked the girl's father if he was satisfied that justice had been done. And to this, the father glared at the journalist and said, justice will be done when I get my daughter back. That's what real justice is. Justice isn't done because you merely enact punitive action on the perpetrator of the crime. That just doesn't cut it. That's not... I mean, that's the best we as human beings can do because we can't bring anyone back from the dead. But that's not God's idea of justice. And that got me thinking about the broader issues of justice, judgment and justification because in the example I've just given, for real justice requires more than just the punishment of the perpetrator. And even if you did raise that child from the dead and brought them back to the family, justice still isn't completely done because... There's a whole bunch of things going on in this. There are actually three problems here. First, there is the innocent victim. Then there is the grieving family. But also, there is a guilty murderer. So there's, there's a threefold problem. Three, there are three groups or people who are affected. The, the victim, those who loved her, and the murderer, him, the murderer himself is also a problem. And real justice would require the raising of the daughter from the dead to be restored to the parents, the forgiveness on the part of the parents to the, towards the murderer, and the dissolving of the evil in the murderer to reform that person, to restore him to peace and to forgiveness. Can you see that? That's what biblical justice looks like. Real justice, and the word, the word here that's used for justice or used for righteousness, literally, in one of its main ways that's understood literally means to take something that is broken and repair it or take something that is crooked and straighten it. 
And so for that situation, for justice to be done, for all the, the crookedness to be straightened, for the brokenness to be repaired, the victim has to be raised from the dead. The grieving family needs to no longer grieve and forgive the murderer, and the murderer needs to be changed. Can you see that? And that, if you get that in your head, if you get that as the idea of justice, then you begin to understand where, what the righteousness of God really is. The righteousness of God is heading towards that and wants that and is trying to form that. And the means by which that happens is through Jesus Christ. So, put very simply, the righteousness of God is God's own faithfulness and justice demonstrated in his goodness and grace towards his creation. And because he does do that, we can say God is good. He's essentially, morally, perfectly and unendingly good. And everything he does is heading in that direction. Um, and so, so what Paul is then able to say is, you see, in the Old Testament, what we have is a testimony to that goodness. Because God kept on being faithful to his people and uh, as he goes on to say a little bit later in verse 25, he says, this was, to show that God's right, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. In other words, he looked at Israel who were messing it all up. And, and, and even though they were messing it up, he overlooked their sins and looking forward to what he was going to do in Jesus Christ as a foreshadowing of the righteousness that would be displayed in Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean that God is just kind of a big fluffy bunny in the sky who just doesn't really care, you know, what's a genocide between friends, that kind of person? And you see, in, in, there's two extremes in the, in, in the broad church. On the one end, you have the kind of the universal fluffy bunny God who would never hurt a fly and would, you know, you know, would never say no to anyone about anything. But then at the, far, the other end, you've got this kind of really strict kind of, if you make one mistake, then God's going to come after you with a piece of wood with a nail through the end of it or, or, or press the smite button on his computer. But neither one of those are true. And nor is some sort of balance in, in the middle. That's not where we come to either. What, what, what we've got to say is all of that's human thinking and we've just got to step above that and see the righteousness of God cannot be compared to the righteousness of human beings. So that what we have to say is that the pride of the self-righteous person is undone by the righteousness of God and the shame of the person who's obviously not righteous is also undone. And, th and that was the whole point I was trying to make last week is that the Jews who knew the law weren't getting in, even the ones who were, who were keeping the law don't get in because they're good. And those who feel like there's no way they could ever get in because they're bad, they're not prevented from getting in because the doorway for both the good and the bad person is Jesus. The Jew, the Gentile, the good person, the bad person. Everyone, doesn't matter who you are, your pride if you're good has to be destroyed by the righteousness of God and your shame if you're bad has to also be dissolved by the righteousness of God and everybody on earth, Jew and Gentile alike, has to come through the one door and that one door is Jesus. The correct answer is always Jesus. <laughs> All right. Like I said, even if, even if you're not paying attention to what I'm saying and I know you would never do that, but just say you were and I look at you and say, what's the answer? The answer is Jesus. Right. And that's what Paul is saying here. God is on display and his righteousness, his goodness and justice is seen not in convicting his creation and destroying it, but in saving it. But nor is God just one who, you know, like it says in, um, in Numbers 14, I shall by no means acquit the guilty. God doesn't acquit the guilty. He justifies the guilty. That's completely different. You know, acquittal just means, oh, I'll well, just forget about it. But if, if, if that happened in a court case and the judge said, oh, well, you know, whatever, to a murderer, you'd say, that's not right. But then just throwing them in prison and letting them rot or executing them, that's not right either as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. What's right is the murderer 
gets changed and restored and the victim is, is able to forgive and is, is also restored. That's biblical justice. That's what, the new, that's what the new world will look like. The world to come is a perfect world in which everything is repaired and renewed and restored. And that's, that's when God is sitting on the throne and his righteousness is rolling out and his justice is being done. Um, and, so, um, and so God doesn't go out and destroy his creatures, as Athanasius said, that would just show his indifference to, his, to the ruin of his own works before his, very iron, before his own eyes and would argue not the goodness of God but limitation. So what does God do? Well, he goes on in verse 23 and says, For all have sinned and fall, fallen short of the glory of God, good, good people and bad. All, but all are justified freely, justified, you know, restored, renewed, straightened out freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. So God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness at this present time so that so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So, that, I mean, that's a lot. What he's saying is, when you see what God has done in, in Jesus, you see the goodness of God. And you see what he's really like. That's, that's just to put it in simple language. You know, Luther um, is the perfect example of what can happen to a person when they see this. Because, you know, Luther, of course, being the great reformer, he was, he was a Roman Catholic, he was a monk, and he was living a life of... of um, almost perfect um, obedience to all the laws and all this. But let me read to you what Luther himself, and, and he actually quotes this passage we're reading today, and this has been one of the most important passages to him. But Luther said of himself that he was indebted to Paul for being instrumental in helping him to appreciate that the righteousness of God was not only displayed in his demand for legal justice, but also in his mercy. As Luther put it elsewhere, I greatly longed to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans and nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the justice or righteousness of God. And then he says, because I took it to mean that by justice, whereby God is just and deals justly by punishing the unjust. And my situation was that although I was an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner, troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him. Therefore, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather I hated and murmured against him. So here's a religious man, right at the top of his game, and he admits he didn't like God, hated him. Intensely disliked this kind of a God. And then he says, but later, however, after studying the epistle to the Romans and coming to a fresh revelation of the love of God, he wrote, and this passage we're looking at was one of the key passages, he wrote, I felt myself to have been reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of scripture took on a whole new meaning. And whereas before the justice of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love, this passage became to me a gate to heaven. Can you see that? Suddenly, he loves this God. He loves the God who's been merciful to him. So true justice is not merely punitive, it's redemptive. Um, you know, and, and the Bible is full of examples of this sort of thing. You know, the woman at the well, she was a sex addict had had five husbands and she was living with a de facto husband, uh, her sixth de facto husband. And Jesus didn't condemn her, but, he, but nor did he just say, oh, well, whatever, just let her go, because she would have just been stuck. No, she, he redeemed her so that she goes running back into town and says, you've got to come and meet the man who told me everything I've ever done. 
Now, normally, I don't want anyone to go telling everyone everything I've ever done, all right? But the, the implication is come and meet the man who knows me inside and out, and he loved me, and he's restored me. That woman, her life was positively changed in an instant in a way that no counsellor or pastor or theologian could ever do. Only Jesus can do that. Or Zacchaeus, a tax collector, in the in space of just a few hours, his whole life has turned around. Or the, the woman who washed Jesus' feet, who was just full of gratitude. And Jesus said, whoever has forgiven much, loves much. And because her many sins have been forgiven, therefore she loves. Or Matthew, the tax collector, who left his station, followed Jesus and became one of the, one of the apostles. Or the woman caught in adultery who the Pharisees wanted to stone. In every one of those cases, justice was done. Looking forward to Jesus, he would carry, he would carry the weight of our sins. But he brings a powerful reformation in those lives. And then, of course, down through Christian history, Luther and Wesley and others who were also in, in, instantly transformed when they understood the gospel or to anyone who trusts in what God has done for them rather than in what we do for God and let me um, let me finish with um, something quoting from N.T. Wright who's commenting on this passage he says all this has come about through the faithfulness of God in the Messiah Jesus Jesus has accomplished to put it another way God has accomplished through Jesus what Israel failed to accomplish. God's own covenant faithfulness is thus unveiled at last, an event to which the law and the prophets pointed and that they could not bring about the faithfulness of the Messiah. The subject matter of the gospel itself denotes specifically his death seen as the culmination of the whole obedience his faithful obedience or obedient faithfulness was the means of dealing with sin and hence of creating a forgiven people. And what I look at when I look out across a bunch of believers is I see the recipients of the mercy of God. And it doesn't matter what your background is, whether you've been raised in the church or you were, it doesn't make any difference. Everyone, I use that quote because a friend of mine who is a, who is a pastor, that's how he describes his upbringing. His, his parents were literally Nazis, anyway. Everyone goes through the same door, and that door is Jesus. And the testimony that we carry as a church is not, look at me, I've got it together. It's, look at me, because God has made me what I am in Jesus Christ. Amen.